Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters, your Magic the Gathering source that helps you command your budget. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. We also have a ton of brand new t-shirt designs in stock, so make sure you check out those as well. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all their support. Hey everyone, Mitch coming in for the Commander's Core Studio. Welcome to the show. So the pre-cons were not supposed to come out last week. They're supposed to come out this week. And yet last week we got some massive pre-con leaks, including some, well, what I think are going to be incredibly popular commanders with Jolene and Benny Brax and a ton of other exciting cards. I mean, I think on that episode I talked about 18 cards or so. <laughs> Quite a bit. But of course, the craziness of this spoiler season is not done just yet because we've got even more leaks today. My goodness, do we have a ton of leaks. So yeah, I'm going to do my best to go through these as well as I can, but these cards are as new to me as they are to you. So if I make any mistakes, well, that's completely my fault. It's got nothing to do with Eddie this time, so I cannot blame Eddie. So with all that said, let's jump into it. So first up, we've got Audacious Swap, an instant for three and a red that has Casualty 2. Again, Casualty is a brand new mechanic from this set. It says, as you cast the spell, you may sacrifice a creature with power two or greater. When you do copy this spell, you may choose a target for the copy. It says the owner of target non-enchantment permanent shovels into their library, then exiles the top card of their library. If it's a land card, they may put it on the battlefield. Otherwise, they may cast out paying its mana cost. So, yeah, I mean, this one essentially seems to be, what, a Chaos Warp, but, you know, costing one more mana and with the ability to copy it, but there is that restriction that, for whatever reason, I'm not sure why exactly they picked Enchantment, but non-Enchantment permanent. So, whereas Chaos Warp can hit anything, including Enchantments, with this one, you cannot. Now, perhaps they picked Enchantment because Red does, you know, historically have a hard time dealing with Enchantments. And also, one other key difference between this and Chaos Warp is that they allow the card to be cast. It's not just, hey, if it's a permanent and it goes into play. So, obviously, that player also gets access to instants and sorceries, whereas previously, if, you know, you Chaos Warped into one of those, well, tough luck. You basically missed out on, you know, your value. So your opponent is going to be getting value out of this no matter what. And again, that might be better, that might be worse. It's, again, slightly more risky than a Chaos Warp and more restrictive, but you do have the ability to copy this spell. And of course, there are going to be times when you actually do benefit from sacrificing that creature, like if you are playing, you know, an aristocrat-style strategy, you actually probably want to do that. Now, that being said, there are definitely going to be times where you want to get rid of an enchantment, but you very much can't, and you wish you had Chaos Warp in your hand. And there are also going to be times when you might audacious swap into a massive insert sorcery spell, and you might regret your decision, but hey, that's the risk of red, right? Regardless, at the end of the day, an exciting card and one that I think a lot of players are going to have fun playing. Next up, and I just want to mention my apologies on some of the crop jobs on this episode, and, and also, again, I'm bound to make mistakes on this because there are a ton of cards, and they are new to me, and I am trying my best to tackle these efficiently, and, well, here we go. Waste Management. No, not the company. An instant four, two in a black that has kicker four, three in a black, and it says exile up to two cards from a single graveyard. If this spell was kicked, instead exile target player's graveyard. Create a 2-2 black rogue creature token for each creature card exiled this way. So for three mana, again, we can exile up to two cards in a graveyard, and if those are creature cards, then we are getting two, two, two. So three mana, instant speed, two, two, twos in graveyard removal. That seems pretty good. Now, obviously, not a slam dunk at a lot of decks out there, but it does have that kicker, which can be really spicy. And again, this is at instant speed. That kicker is decently expensive. I mean, making this entire spell cost, what, seven mana? But still, I mean, that is a ton of value being able to take out a player's graveyard. And again, say that is, you know, a reanimator kind of graveyard or, you know, a graveyard centric deck, or maybe you've got a mill deck where you're putting a ton of things into someone's graveyard and they've got a ton of creatures. Well, you can get a lot of value out of this, making a giant army out of nowhere. 
Now, I think this one's going to be restricted to more specific decks because, yeah, I mean, for a mill strategy, this one could be pretty good if you do need, you know, just a, okay, let's just emergency, get rid of someone's graveyard, and also get a ton of creatures that you can either win with or, you know, you can just stall with long enough in play to actually mill those players out. Overall, though, I like the flexibility and I like the design of this card. Moving on, though, Sinister Concierge, a 2-1 human wizard that costs 1 in a blue. It has, when it dies, you may exile it and put three time counters on it. If you do, exile to one target creature and put three time counters on it. Each card exiled this way that doesn't have suspend, gains suspend. So the card that this reminds me of, I think the name is Apocrisite. Anyways, uh, both, I believe, exile, you know, when they die, gaining suspend. Now that card isn't, you know, all that popular in Commander and for good reason, but this one, I think this one's pretty spicy. It's like a low to the ground conditional temporary removal spell. When it dies, it might go away temporarily, again, for what, three turns essentially with three time counters on it, but it's taking something else with it. So your opponent's gonna have to wait quite a while for their creature to come back, and when your creature comes back too, again, if it dies again, you can exile something else. Now, I'm not exactly sure what kinds of decks out there are going to want to utilize this card, but yeah, I think this card can definitely make an impact on the game when it is in play, and definitely change up the way that people might attack, because, hey, if you've got this in play and someone's got a creature that they would love to keep in play, and if they're going to attack you, you're going to be like, all right, well, you know, I might just block and then get rid of that very important creature to you, and it's going to be gone for quite some time. So, yeah, we'll see what kind of decks want this card, and yeah, I think it can definitely be a spicy card once it's in play. Next up, though, we've got Spellbinding Soprano, a 2-2 human bard that costs 1 in a red. It has, when it attacks, instant sorcery spells you cast this turn cost 1 less to cast. And on top of that, this has Encore for three and a red. So yeah, that seems pretty spicy. So in a way, this is kind of like a Goblin Electromancer to start off with, though obviously you do have to send your creature into um, combat to actually get that effect. That being said, your opponents might not want to block because, well, if they do take this creature out and it's in your graveyard, you can encore it back out. And again, I probably should have mentioned encoring basically is you exile the creature from your graveyard. For each opponent, you get a token copy of it that has to attack that turn. Then that creature is sacrificed at the end of the turn or end step or whatnot. But yeah, basically you get three copies of this in Commander. And then when you attack with those again, your instant sorcery spells are going to cost three less to cast, which is a massive amount. So this can save you a good amount of mana throughout the game when it's just this one in play, but when you've got three in play, you can have that massive turn where you're saving three mana per spell that turn. Sorry, per instant sorcery spell, but yeah, for the decks that you're playing with this, they're going to be spell slinging decks, maybe, you know, storm kind of decks out there where you're just casting spell after spell after spell, and three is a massive amount. So this card can have an impact early in the game and also later in the game as well. It can have a massive game ending impact too. It's definitely going to be interesting to see kind of how, again, those spell slinging and storm decks can utilize this card and which ones are going to want it. Next up, we've got Smuggler's Buggy, which is, you know, I, I wonder if this is going to have a nickname too, because obviously we've got Smuggler's Copter, which is the Looter Scooter. I don't know if this one's going to be nickname worthy, but we'll see. Smuggler's Buggy is a 5 by vehicle that costs 4 and it's got crew too. On top of that, it's got Hideaway 4, so when it enters the battlefield, you look at the top four cards of your library, exile one face down, then put the rest of the bottom of your library in a random order. On top of that, whenever Smuggler's Buggy deals combat damage to a player, you may cast the exiled card without paying its mana cost if you do return Smuggler's Buggy to its owner's hand. So this is a repeatable hideaway effect on a vehicle, one that, well, does cost four mana, though it is a 5-5, but it doesn't have any evasion or, you know, trample or anything like that or ways to get it through. That being said... It does have a low crew cost at just two, so it's very easy for you to crew this up. And yeah, I mean, if there is a board wipe or something like that, vehicles are very difficult to deal with because, you know, your typical Wrath of God board wipes are sorcery speed, so they're not going to get rid of vehicles. So if you or someone else wraths the board, then you can easily get this through on a player to cast that card for free. Now, hopefully the card that you are casting, you know, costs more than four mana, so you're getting some extra, you know, cost savings on that. But then, yeah, you can just replay this, hide away for again, and then, you know, get some additional value out of that again. So a really interesting repeatable hideaway effect that we're seeing on a vehicle. Now, obviously, you know, vehicle tribal kind of decks out there are definitely going to want to utilize this card. Or maybe, you know, a, a deck like, you know, Galta, Dinos in Cars, because Dinos in Cars is fun. 
Moving on, though, next up we've got Maestro's Confluence, a sorcerer for three blue, black, red. So quite a bit of mana there, but let's see what this one does. Choose three, you may choose the same mode more than once. Return target monocolored instant or sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand. Target creature gets minus three, minus three until end of turn. Go to each creature target player controls. So essentially either recur three things, uh, maybe take out three small creatures or, you know, a big creature and a small creature or a massive creature or go to everyone's creatures or, you know, some combination of all of these. I mean, six mana is a lot for a spell, but this one does give you some good flexibility. That being said, for that third one, Disrupt the Quorum does the exact same thing, and it costs four in total. Obviously, it's nowhere near as flexible, but if that's what you're choosing, you are paying a bit more for that. Now, that being said, obviously, goading everyone's creatures is an incredibly powerful effect that can really change the game. And obviously, if you do have three mono-colored or sorceries in your graveyard, that can be a lot of value getting three cards back. That being said, that monocolored restriction can definitely come into play, and there might be times where there's a multicolored insert sorcery that you're going to wish that you could get back, and unfortunately, you cannot. And also, you know, if that second mode is what you are just choosing, you know, paying six mana to just take out, you know, one or two creatures might not really be the most cost-efficient way to go about it. So my initial gut reaction to this confluence is that it's not quite as powerful as the other confluence that we've seen so far, which I believe was the Riveteers. But yeah, there definitely can be some Grixis decks out there that can utilize this spell if they really, you know, like recursion or, you know, getting rid of certain creatures or, you know, especially causing some chaos and goading some creatures. Moving on, we got Make an Example. It's a sorcery for a three and a black that says... Each opponent separates the creatures they control into two piles. For each opponent, you choose one of their piles. Each opponent sacrifices the creatures in their chosen pile, and piles can be empty. Now, if an opponent does decide to make one of their piles empty, well, you could just, you know, say, okay, well, get rid of all of your creatures then, so they might not want to do that. That being said, yes, this is the type of card where you can make deals with, and yeah, your opponents might be willing to make a deal to keep certain creatures in play. So yeah, but at face value, this is kind of like a factor fiction, but for creature removal. Obviously, with the more and more creatures on the board, the bigger of impact this makes taking out more creatures for just four mana. That being said, if one of your opponents has, you know, one key creature in play and a good amount of other creatures that, you know, aren't nearly as important, and they give you the tough decision of picking between those two piles, it can be a very tough choice not taking out, you know, five creatures instead of just one when you want to get rid of that one very badly. Definitely an interesting card that can lead to some very interesting choices, and again, one that you can wheel and deal with, but at the end of the day, I think there are better forms of removal out there, and we'll see what kinds of decks really want to utilize this. Again, it definitely could be, you know, more of a political card where you kind of make those deals with those opponents, being like, okay, look, hey, if you make these piles this way, I'll let you keep this pile as long as you don't attack me with those creatures for two turns, let's say. Something like that. Next up, we've got Flawless Forgery, a sorcery for three blue blue that's got Casualty 3. So again, with that Casualty 3, that means you can sacrifice a creature with power 3 or greater to copy the spell. It says, Exile target insert sorcery card from an opponent's graveyard. Copy that card. You may cast the copy without paying its mana cost. Now, this card most definitely reminds me of something like Spell Twine. Though Spell Twine obviously costs one more and cannot be copied, it does give you access to one spell in your graveyard and one spell in an opponent's graveyard. That being said, this one is restricted to just an opponent's graveyard, which is a big difference. Because there are definitely going to be times where, well, maybe the best spell you've got in an opponent's graveyard that you can actually cast, since it's limited to just instant sorceries, is like a Brainstorm, which, you know, if you're paying five mana for a Brainstorm, that might not be the most cost-efficient way to go about things. Now, obviously, there might be other times where you can get a massive amount of value from this by copying this and casting two massive spells, but I think this card is pretty limited in kind of decks that are actually going to want it. Five mana is a good amount for an instant or sorcery, and you might end up paying more for this than the spell that you're going to be casting most of the time. Now, obviously, you can get this spell twice. Casualty 3 is a decent restriction, but yeah, again, like I mentioned before, there are definitely decks out there like Aristocrat Style Strategies that actually want to sacrifice creatures, so you never know. Moving on, how about Determine Iteration, an enchantment for one in a red, and it says at the beginning of combat on your turn, populate. The token created this way gains haste, sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. And yeah, populate, I believe, is a mechanic that came out with one of the Ravnica's, like Return to Ravnica or something like that. Anyways, to populate, you get a token that's a copy of a creature token you control. So yeah, if you've got a token deck that can make some high value tokens, well, you're going to absolutely love this low to the ground enchantment. You can use that token right away. Again, this gives that token haste, which is fantastic. Now you did the sacrifice at the beginning of the end step, but this might actually be a good thing in certain strategies. Again, 
If, say, with these tokens, maybe you've got, you know, certain tokens that have ETBs or LTBs, you know, kind of like in my Jigantha Karuga deck, this definitely could find a spot in there. You can definitely take advantage of just creating a lot of tokens with this throughout the game for a ton of value, and yes, still being able to swing with them while getting additional value. Again, for just two mana. Now, again, this is a pretty specific enchantment, and obviously it's not going to fit into decks that aren't going to be making creature tokens, but for those decks out there, this can be a ton of value throughout the game for just two mana again. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about this one for that deck. So here's hoping it is budget friendly. Next up, speaking of one that I really hope is budget friendly, Extravagant Replication, an enchantment for four blue blue. It says at the beginning of your upkeep, create a token that's a copy of another target non-land permanent you control. This is absolutely huge in my Giganta Karuga deck if it can stay in play. Now that is a big mana investment, and again, this is an upkeep trigger, so you basically aren't really getting any value out of this right away. But if this stays in play, you get a ton of value throughout the game. You can essentially just keep picking, you know, your most impactful permanent in play, and non-land permanent that is not this, and just keep making token after token after token throughout the game. And of course, if those are creature tokens and you've got ways to populate those, well, you've got even more ways to get more value out of this. Now, outside of decks that care about, you know, making tokens and populating and those kinds, how much impact is this going to have? I really am not sure. Again, that is a decent investment. And again, it is a permanent that's not giving you any value until your next upkeep. And this might be a good target for removal because, well, this can generate you a ton of value, especially if you've got something massive in play. So yeah, we'll see. But yeah, I hope this is budget. So I at least have the option of putting it in my Giganta Karuga deck if I end up doing that. Moving on though, we've got Master of Ceremonies, a 3-4 Rhino Druid that costs three and a white. It says at the beginning of your upkeep, each opponent chooses money, friends, or secrets. For each player who chose money, you and that player each create a treasure token. For each player who chose friends, you and that player each create a 1-1 one, one green and white citizen creature token. For each player who chose secrets, you and that player each draw a card. So with this 4 mana Rhino, again if it can stay in play, you are getting an upkeep trigger that can generate you a good amount of value on each of your turns. Obviously you are also giving value to your opponents as well and they are making the decision, but still, I mean there's going to be times where that player would like an extra mana on their turn and they want a treasure, so congratulations, you also get a treasure. Now if they want you to get probably the least amount of value out of this, they're probably going to give you that citizen and they'll take the creature token as well, but yeah, there are definitely going to be times where they want to draw a card as well desperately and then you're going to get another card as well. And of course, there are ways to get even more value out of this than your opponents by having something like, you know, Anointed Procession in play to double up your tokens, or, you know, some way to draw even more cards like Teferi's Age of Insight. And of course, again, this is the kind of card that I think definitely fits in those politics-style strategies where you kind of wheel and deal with opponents, and you're like, hey, if you do this for me and pick this one, I can do something for you. So yeah, definitely a card that can put an interesting spin on a game and can definitely lead to some interesting plays. Next up, we've got Into Deep, and, and yeah, now I've got the Sum 41 song stuck in my head now. It's an enchantment aura that costs blue blue. It has split seconds, so yeah, split seconds back, which basically means as long as this spell's on the stack, players can't cast spells or activate abilities that aren't mana abilities. So for the most part, it is impossible to stop this, except for, you know, with like special actions and stuff like that, but yeah, it is very difficult to stop. Anyways, Enchant Creature, Planeswalker, or Clue. It says Enchanted Permanent is a colorless clue artifact with pay to sacrifice this artifact draw card and loses all other abilities. So it's no longer a creature or planeswalker. So yeah, this is a very interesting piece of tech that can be very impactful in a lot of situations. At a certain point, it's kind of like a two mana removal spell that is going to be very hard to stop again. I mean, obviously your opponents can remove this. It is an aura, but still, if they don't have a way to take this off, they're going to have to pay two to sacrifice their own, again, what was a creature or planeswalker, and get rid of it. So, you know, if that is their commander, to recast it. And yeah, that can be a good amount of mana investment for them to do all this just to get something back. So this is kind of along the lines of those, you know, Dark Stale Mutation, you know, Kenris Transformation type cards. But yeah, definitely an interesting take on it. And it's going to be interesting to see what kinds of decks want this. Moving on, we've got Currency Converter, an artifact for one that says whenever you discard a card, you may exile that card from your graveyard. And by paying two and tapping it, you draw a card, then discard a card. So at this point, it just looks like Bag of Holding, but let's see what's different. Tap, put a card, exile with Currency Converter into your graveyard. If it's a land card, create a treasure token. If it's a non-land card, create a 2 2 black rogue creature token. So this one is definitely an interesting one. Again, it's kind of like Bag of Holding where you're getting additional value from getting cards into your graveyard by discarding them because they get exiled. And then with Bag of Holding, you know, you can get that back. With this one, it's more so you can get those cards back in your graveyard 
kind of one at a time essentially with this. I mean, obviously, if you've got ways to untap it, great, you can do more. But it essentially says, hey, um, if you're getting lands back, great, you get a treasure token. If it's not a land, you're getting creature tokens. Now, this card does seem to be pretty specific. Again, if you've got a deck that doesn't have a lot of discard effects, you're not going to want to utilize that. And if you do have a discard deck, if it's a deck that actually cares about having things in your graveyard, you're not going to want this either because it's going to take you a while to actually get those things back. That being said, again, if you have a discard deck that doesn't care about having things in your graveyard, well, you can just essentially get extra value out of your discards and get mana back from them or, you know, get creature tokens as well. And of course, if you've got ways to untap this again, you've got ways to generate even more value out of this. And yeah, maybe commanders like Tormod or Sir Conrad might care about this because they care about, you know, cards either coming in your graveyard or leaving your graveyard, etc, etc, etc. But I think this card is going to be pretty specific for the decks that actually want it. Moving on, though, we've got Resourceful Defense and Enchantment for 2 and a white. It says whenever a permanent you control leaves the battlefield, if it had counters on it, put those counters on target permanent you control. And by paying four and a white, you move any number of counters from target permanent you control to another target permanent you control. So this one really reminds me of the Ozolith, but in a different way. The Ozolith only cares about, you know, permanents that are creatures, whereas this one cares about all of your permanents. So if any of your permanents have counters on them and they leave the battlefield, you get those counters on something else. Also, the Ozolith kind of gets the counters on itself and then moves them around later, whereas this one's like, you immediately get those counters onto another one of your things. That being said, obviously, in a similar way, this one cares about when the permanent leaves the battlefield. So, yeah, it's not like, you know, when a creature dies or anything like that. You actually can just, you know, exile one of your creatures and bring it back with maybe a blink spell. And that is going to be a way to actually get those counters onto something else immediately. Or, you know, if someone bounces your creature, you get those counters on something else immediately, too. And even if, say, you don't have another creature in play and you want to move plus plus one counters when the creature leaves play, you can still, you know, put those on a land or something else and then just pay that mana later to actually move those counters to that creature when it comes back. So yeah, for decks that really care about counters and making sure that they can kind of keep the mass amount of counters that they have, yeah, this could definitely be a card that can impact them. Moving on, we've got Rose Room Treasurer, a 4-3 Ogre Warrior for three and a red. It has alliance whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, create a treasure token if this is the first or second time this ability has resolved this turn. Otherwise, you may pay X when you do Rose Room Treasure deals X damage to any target. So this is a pretty interesting card that I definitely did not expect to see. And yeah, it took me a time or two reading through it to make sure I understood it fully. Basically, hey, ETBs for treasures on the first two of your creatures in a turn. And then after that, you can start paying X to start picking things down. Now, obviously, if you've got ways to get multiple creatures in on, you know, a lot of turns, because again, this counts any turns, essentially, you are going to be able to make a lot of treasures with this. If you're making two creatures per turn on every turn, that's what, eight treasures in one trip around the table? And of course, if you want to utilize that mana to, you know, take, you know, a creature or even a player out at some point, well, yeah, just get a third creature in play and dump a ton of mana into that to ping something down. So yeah, for a kind of go wide strategy or, you know, a creature token strategy with this kind of a card, you can get a ton of value and it can even be a finisher in some ways as well. Moving on, we've got Xander's Pact, a sorcery for four black black with casualty too. So again, copy it by sacrificing a creature with power two or greater. It says each opponent exiles the top card of their library. You may cast spells from among those cards this turn. If you cast a spell this way, pay life equal to that spell's mana value rather than pay its mana cost. So this is kind of like a one-off, or again, I should say with that casualty, a two-off Atali kind of play essentially, where you are getting free spells at the top of your opponent's libraries. Although Atali, I guess, uh, counts your library as well. You know what I mean? Or maybe more so in a way, it's kind of like a reverse Bullis' Citadel, but for two cards, I don't know. It's an interesting card for sure. Now, obviously, this spell can just really whiff. You hit things that you don't need, or you hit things that maybe have too high of a converted mana cost that you don't want to pay all that much life towards. Or yeah, you might just hit some really impactful things, and this could make a huge play for you. Again, you could basically cast up to six spells with this, essentially, if you do have that casualty too. And of course, if you've got, you know, top of the library manipulation for your opponents, where you kind of can know what's on top, and you don't know when you want to cast this, great. But there's definitely times where this can whiff. And yeah, there's definitely going to be times where this can have some big plays. So it's a high risk, high reward kind of card. And I'm not really sure exactly what kind of decks out there are really going to want it. Again, maybe a deck that really cares about top library manipulation or utilizing your opponent's cards. That could definitely find a spot in those decks. Next up, though, we've got Cryptic Pursuit and Enchantment for 2, blue, red. And it says, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell from your hand, manifest the top card of your library. 
And whenever a face down creature you control dies, exile it if it's an instant or sorcery card, you may cast that card until end of your next turn. So this is a very interesting card that essentially kind of gives you an extra value out of casting instant sorceries by basically giving you a 2-2 creature, which again comes off the top of your library and your opponents have no idea what that card actually is underneath. And that again can be very impactful because when those creatures do die, if they are instant and sorceries, you can cast them until the end of your next turn. So this can essentially just give you free 2-2s two throughout the game by just casting instant and sorceries, and then also access to spells if those were actually instant and sorceries on the top of your library. And of course, with those manifested cards, if they are actually creatures, you could flip them over for their mana cost if you really want to. So yeah, this card has a good amount of potential for decks out there that might be casting a ton of instants and sorceries. I mean, at the end of the day, it's kind of like a tall ran sky summoner in play, but uh, for, you know, not flyers, but still just make two twos that also can give you extra card advantage throughout the game if they are instant and sorceries that you can utilize again. Overall, definitely an interesting and unique card. Moving on though, we've got Avon Courier, a 1-1 Bird Advisor with flying that costs 1 in a blue. It has, when it attacks, choose a counter on a permanent you control, put a counter of that kind on target permanent you control if it doesn't have a counter of that kind on it. So this is kind of like a weird uh, individual proliferate effect, but in a different way. Essentially, you are spreading counters around, I mean, one at a time, but yeah, I mean, if something's got, you know, a flying counter on it, or a, you know, indestructibility counter on it, or a shield counter on it, those can be some higher value counters that you're essentially getting on other things. And obviously, this does work with, you know, plus plus one counters as well, which can be impactful, especially for decks that might also be proliferating to, you know, at least get one counter on those things so that you can start building up those counters with those other proliferate effects. That being said, though, do keep in mind that this only counts your permanence. So yeah, you can't, you know, give those negative kinds of counters like minus one, minus one counters to your opponent's creatures because you can only target your own. But yeah, for a deck out there that might be utilizing a lot of counters that they want distributed, sure, this could definitely find a spot. Next up, we've got Park Heights Maverick, a 2-2 human soldier with dethrone that costs two and a green. Park Heights Maverick can't be blocked by creatures with power two or less, and whenever it deals combat damage to a player or dies, proliferate. So first up, obviously this can get larger because of that dethrone if you keep attacking the player that I believe has the highest life total or tied with the highest life total, so yeah, you can keep making this larger and larger throughout the game. On top of that, it can be more difficult to block because your opponent's tiny creatures can't, you know, jump block it if they really want to, or, you know, can't team block it. So your opponent's gonna need, you know, a, I mean, two power is not a ton. So yeah, if they've got a creature of three power or more, obviously they can block it, but still this can help you get through any good amount of situations. And of course, when it does hit your opponent, it can get larger and larger because, well, you're gonna be proliferating. So yeah, you can just keep growing this and obviously other things as well with counters. And obviously you get an additional value when this dies being able to proliferate as well. So yeah, I mean, if you're in a counters build, maybe you wanna consider this card if you want an additional proliferate effect. Moving on though, we've got Dogged Detective, a 2 on human rogue that costs 1 in a black. When it enters the battlefield, you're going to surveil 2, and then whenever an opponent draws their second card each turn, you may return Dog Detective from your graveyard to your hand. So surveilling like Scry isn't card advantage, but it is card selection, and unlike Scry, again, a lot of decks out there really care about their graveyard, so getting cards into your graveyard can be very impactful. On top of that, obviously, this can be a creature that can repeatedly keep coming back to your hand because, well, you know, in a game like Commander, players love drawing cards, so you're probably going to have multiple times where your opponents are drawing multiple cards in a turn, and when they do, you get this back to your hand. So perhaps an Aristocrat-style strategy or maybe one that cares about the graveyard can heavily utilize this card, you know, again and again and again throughout the game, not, you know, just for a body on the field, which can be great, but also, again, for that repeated card selection with Surveil. So in a way, it's kind of like a reassembling skeleton-ish. I mean, nowhere near as impactful because you can't get it back right away and it doesn't go right into play, it goes into your hand. But again, one that does provide you value in a different way with that surveil. Next up though, we've got Mask of the Schemer, an artifact equipment that costs two in a blue and it's got an equip cost of two. It says, whenever equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, it connives X, where X is the amount of damage it dealt to that player. So conniving is a new mechanic from this set. Basically, you draw cards and discard cards, and if you're discarding non-land cards, you get a plus one counter on this creature. So yeah, if you can get a massive creature to get through on an opponent and dish out a lot of damage, you can get a ton of value out of this. Essentially, this is, hey, yeah, loot X, you know, based off of that damage, and then also grow your creature. Well, maybe not quite X again, it's by discarding non-land cards, but still you can grow your creature again and again and again to help them hit for more and more and more each time to help you get even more card selection out of this. 
in a deck that might revolve around equipment or, you know, getting a massive creature through. I mean, yeah, a Voltron strategy might want to utilize this card just for, again, all that card selection and then also a way to just grow that creature throughout the game. Moving on, though, we've got yet another Confluence with Obscura Confluence, an instant for one white, blue, black. Like the other Confluences, it says choose three may choose the same mode more than once. Until end of turn, target creature loses all abilities and has base power and toughness 1-1 one, one, or target creature connives or target player returns a creature card from their graveyard to their hand. So you can essentially make three creatures tiny and take away all their abilities, you know, make three creatures connive or I guess the same creature connive three times or make target player return three creature cards from their graveyard to their hand or again, a combination of any of these. To be honest, I'm not really blown away by this. And I'm not sure exactly what kinds of decks out there are going to want this. I mean, yes, that first mode can be impactful in the right situation. You know, if your opponent's attacking with certain creatures and you want to get rid of some of them, you can make them really, really small and take away all their abilities. So that can be great. Uh, looting, you know, again, and getting some counters on a creature can be good as well. And yeah, if you don't have any creatures in your graveyard or any ones that you really care about getting back, that last mode is just kind of gone. Now, obviously, there's just a first impression on this card, so I could be wrong on this, but yeah, it definitely does not blow me away. And I think, you know, another confluence like the Riveteers confluence is definitely going to have more of an impact in Commander. Next up, though, we've got Prosperous Partnership and Enchantment for one red white. When it enters the battlefield, you're going to create two 1 1 green and white citizen creature tokens, and by tapping three untapped creatures you control, you create a treasure token. So, three mana make two creatures, and yeah, that second part is definitely going to be the more impactful part of this card, but obviously, the first lets you get there. Being able to tap three creatures for a treasure token can help you a lot throughout the game. I mean, maybe in a go wide or a token strategy, you just got a ton of tokens in play, and maybe you're just holding them back for the time being. Right before your turn, you're just like, okay, I've got, you know, nine creatures in play. Cool. Just tap them all to make a treasure token for each, you know, three of them. So three treasure tokens. And of course, if you know you have ways to untap creatures, you know, untapping your army with something like maybe two arms, you can definitely do that and utilize this card even further to make even more treasure. So yeah, I can definitely see this card being a good consideration for, you know, token strategies or go wide strategies that actually, you know, want even more tokens, obviously, when this comes into play. And then obviously ways to utilize those tokens, you know, maybe outside of combat by utilizing them to make treasures throughout the game. And of course, obviously, if you've got something like Annoyed Procession, you can get even more value out of this. And yeah, I mean, the more and more treasures that you can make, obviously, the more and more ways that you can abuse this card. Moving on, though, next up, we've got Sky Boon Evangelist, a 3-3 bird advisor with flying that costs four and a white. And when it enters the battlefield, you're going to support six. It says whenever a creature with a counter on it attacks one of your opponents, that creature gains flying until end of turn. Now, support six basically means that you get a plus one counter on each of up to six other target creatures. So yeah, obviously, the more creatures that you have in play, the more value that you get out of this. And of course, by getting counters on essentially all of your creatures, that can really impact you by basically being kind of like a wonder effect by saying, hey, my creatures have counters. Therefore, if they attack you, they get flying until end of turn. Now, again, that is until end of turn, but obviously that is kind of more impactful, you know, just being able to swing at players and, you know, being able to get damage through with that kind of evasion. It's not going to help, you know, when it comes to blocking because your creatures want to flying then, but still. So yeah, this card can definitely make an impact in a go wide strategy, maybe a token strategy or one that really cares about counters on creatures and, you know, one that might be aggressive. Next up, we've got Body Count, an instant for two in a black that's got a spectral cost of a black. And again, spectacle means that you can cast this spell for its spectacle cost rather than its mana cost if an opponent lost life this turn. Regardless, it says, draw a card for each creature that died under your control this turn. Yeah, I think aristocrat style strategies are going to love this card. I mean, this can be a one mana draw like 10 easily for those kinds of decks. I mean, even just paying three mana is not all that bad. And again, all you have to do is get one point of damage or, you know, one life lost on one opponent to actually just cast this for just one mana again at instant speed. And Aristocrat style strategies, again, obviously love sacrificing a ton of creatures in a turn. So yeah, however many of those creatures you want to sacrifice, you could draw that many cards at instant speed again for maybe just one mana. And of course, even outside of Aristocrat style strategies or even you know, with them too, this is just great board wipe protection in a way, or at least I should say you get value out of, you know, your things being wiped because hey, for again, either three or one mana, if someone lost life that turn or an opponent lost life, I should say, you are just essentially replacing all those creatures that you lost with card draw. And keep in mind, again, this doesn't specify non-token. So yeah, I think this card can make a massive impact in certain decks out there and can be a great value card in other ones as well. Moving on, though, we've got Killer Service, and I love that name, an enchantment for two and a green. 
When he enters the battlefield, create a number of food tokens equal to the number of opponents you have. So again, in a game like Commander, if uh, everyone's still, you know, alive, then you get, you know, three tokens. And at the beginning of your end step, you may pay two and sacrifice a token. If you do, create a 4-4 four, four green Rhino Warrior creature token. So this is a pretty interesting card. I mean, obviously this is giving you food tokens, which, yeah, you can use to gain life, or you can utilize them to essentially turn them into Rhinos. And 4-4s four are decently large and definitely can make an impact in a game. Now, obviously, this has the potential to allow you to turn other tokens into those 4-4 Rhinos, essentially, by sacrificing them for just two mana at your end step. Again, you are limited to just one of these for, you know, each of your turns, though. And you do have to pay for that. That being said, maybe an Aristocrat-style strategy could utilize this to an effect where it's like, hey, okay, I'm going to sacrifice one of my token creatures, you know, get a good amount of value out of that for my other effects, and then also get a 4-4 Rhino token, which, you know, maybe I can sacrifice later. Which, ironically, you can actually just sacrifice, uh, you know, that Rhino token to this later to actually make another Rhino, which again, obviously, you know, for a lot of decks wouldn't really do anything, but for an Aristocrat style strategy, we're getting a ton of benefits off of a creature dying. You can just keep getting repeated value. Next up, we've got yet another cool name for a card with Misfortune Teller. Misfortune Teller is a 3-1 human warlock with death touch that costs 3 and a black, and it says whenever it enters the battlefield or deals combat damage to a player, exile target card from a graveyard. If it was a creature card, create a 2-2 black rogue creature token. If it was a land card, create a treasure token. Otherwise, you gain 3 life. Now, this one does give you value on ETB, which is nice, but this one is dependent on actually hitting your opponents to get continued value. And while this does have Death Touch, which can definitely make it harder to block, it also only has one toughness, so if an opponent just has, say, like a 1-1 token lying around, yeah, they can make that trade so you're not getting additional value out of this. Now, obviously, if you've got a way to blink this, you can obviously get value out of it throughout the game without, you know, sending it into, you know, danger during combat. But yeah, I think this is a very specific card for specific decks out there. Moving on, though, we've got Shield Broker, a 3-4 Cephalid Advisor for 3 blue blue. When it enters the battlefield, put a shield counter on target non-commander creature you don't control. You gain control of that creature for as long as there's a shield counter on it. I think it's pretty interesting that they specified non-commander. I mean, maybe just because they, they feel bad, I guess, if you steal someone's commander. Especially if they shield counter on it because then it's harder to get rid of, so maybe that's it. I mean, personally, I think that's a weird thing to specify. There are other, you know, meaner cards out there. I guess maybe you don't want those in a pre-con, though? I don't know. So this is a decent way to actually steal a creature for a good amount of time. I mean, the creature is protected again by that shield counter, and as long as it has it, it stays in play. But once that shield counter is removed, either by being dealt damage once or, you know, being destroyed once, essentially, then that opponent gets that thing back. Now, obviously, again, if you've got a way to use and abuse this, you know, by either making copies of it or, again, you know, by just blinking it, yeah, you could just keep stealing your opponent's things again and again and again. I still think this is a pretty specific card for, you know, maybe, again, blink decks out there or, you know, copy decks out there, so we'll see. Next up, though, we've got Lethal Scheme, an instant for two black black, and it's got Convoke. So with Convoke, we can utilize our creature's help cast this spell, and it says destroy target creature or planeswalker. Each creature that convoked Lethal Scheme connives. So the more and more creatures that we utilize help cast this spell, the more value we're going to get out of this. For mana to destroy a creature or planeswalker, yeah, there are more efficient ways to do that, but again, we can use our creatures I'll pay for this, and when we do, again, we get some great card selection as well with that conniving. You know, on top of also potentially getting counters on those creatures as well. So in a go wide or token strategy, you can really make use out of this card and get a good amount of value out of it. I mean, again, at, at the highest end of this card, it could be destroy a creature or planeswalker, draw four, discard four, and get four counters on those, or one counter on each of those creatures. So yeah, that can be a very big play if you're set up properly. Now, obviously, if you don't have any creatures in play, paying four mana to do this, you probably don't really want to do that a lot of the time. But we finally have gotten to the last card in this episode with Bribe Taker. Bribe Taker is a 6-6 Rhino Warrior with Trample that costs 5 and a green. It says, when it enters the battlefield for each kind of counter on permanence you control, you may put at your choice of a plus one counter or that kind of counter on Bribe Taker. So obviously, the more kinds of counters you have on permanence you control, the more of an impact this can have. That being said, as long as I'm reading this correctly, it does seem like this card is pretty limited on what kinds of decks are going to want it. I mean, if you've got a deck that cares about a lot of different kinds of counters, like, you know, indestructible counter, you know, shield counter, you know, flying counter, plus plus one counter, sure. I mean, it is going to be dependent on your board state heavily, and also that you have a lot of counters out there, and a lot of different counters out there at that. That being said, yeah, I'm sure there's going to be a scenario where this comes down and just gets absolutely deadly in no time. But yeah, this was the last card to go through, and of course, there are a ton to go through, so thank you for staying with me through it all. And of course, as always, thanks again, and have a good one.